Good morning, good evening, good afternoon for uh, everyone joining us. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, my name is Antoine Godin. I'm the head of the macroeconomic modeling team at the AFD headquarters in, in Paris, and I'm delighted to be your host for the webinar today. Um, uh, the, the webinar will talk about uh, nature-related risks in South Africa. Um, as you are well aware, biodiversity is the living fabric of our world. Um, and in the recent years, we have seen economic activities and social socio-economic activities uh, uh, leading to uh, biodiversity uh, uh, erosion and, and destruction. Um, and so in this context, it's important to understand the uh, uh, risks and opportunities that are related to uh, biodiversity dynamics. And uh, the theme of this uh, webinar is exactly to talk about this. We have uh, four uh, very distinguished uh, speakers today. Uh, that will um, present the uh, recent study that AFD, SANBI, DFFE uh, uh, and others have published, uh, well, have been working on and, and will be published soon. So first we'll have Alex Marsh, who's a policy advisor on biodiversity finance and ecological uh, infrastructure at the South African National Biodiversity Institute, uh, SANBI. We'll also have Yuval Chechik, uh, who's a technical advisor and director at the Strategic Programs and Sustainability Finance, Biodiversity and Conservation at the Department of Environment, Forestry, uh, Fishery, For Forestry and Fishery in South Africa as well. And uh, we'll have also Julie Clark, who's an environmental analyst at the Development Bank of South Africa, uh, DBSA also in South Africa. And uh, Paula G. Lazaro, who's a PhD student in ecological macroeconomics um, at Sorbonne Paris Nord University. Julien Clark, uh, Julien, sorry, Julien Cala, a research officer of ecology and biodiversity at AFD headquarters in Paris. Um, and um, so these, all of these very, very interesting people will either uh, present the study or comment the study. Um, for all of us, all of you that are joining us, uh, you can ask questions and uh, chat on the right, on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, please use the question tab to ask your question, and you can uh, vote to get them a higher or lower in the in the in the in the in the, in the quiz of question. But the chat is also there uh, for you if you have a specific discussion that you want to have. Um, the presentation uh, will last about an hour between presentation and discussion of the study, and then we'll have time for for uh, uh, Q&A uh, afterwards, and I will be moderating. So I won't take too much of uh, the time because I think it's more important to concentrate on the study. So um, I will now leave the floor to Alex to uh, do the introduction of the study um, once the slides are ready and up. There you go. Alex, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Antoine. And good afternoon, everybody. Really good to be with all of you today. Um, before getting into the, um, the meat of the study, I wanted to provide some of the context for this work in South Africa. So as Antoine said, my name is Alex Marsh. I work for the South African National Biodiversity Institute. Um, and where we work both at a catchment national and international scale with quite a strong focus on uh, bringing science-based evidence uh, into policy and giving policy advice both to government and to civil society in order to improve decision making. Um, so just to set the scene a little bit for how this work came to be, one of the projects we're currently implementing is uh, the Jeff funded ecological infrastructure for water security project. Um, and the project has quite a strong focus on unlocking development finance um, for ecological infrastructure in areas important for water security in South Africa. And one of the, the relatively new focal areas for Sandy that has been sitting in this particular Jeff project has been around working intensively with blended finance. And part of that has been working more with banks and insurance agencies in order to start to make the case for biodiversity and ecological infrastructure investment. What we've what we were very aware of in approaching this work is that we needed to increase our knowledge base uh, in South Africa around nature-related financial risk. There was a need to partner with sectors that we hadn't necessarily been working very closely with in the past, um, and to do it in a way that uh, supported the larger resource mobilization area of work that we engage with with our department, Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, and also with the Department of Water and Sanitation. 
And part of that, um, and we've been learning this lesson for quite a few years now, is uh, in engaging in work and creating working relationships across different sectors, there's a phase of developing a shared language. And with the finance sector and in the insurance sector and us uh, working with National Treasury, we were very aware of the need to figure out how to um, speak about the need to unlock investment in biodiversity in a manner that made sense in those spaces. And this is kind of where the, the collaboration with AFD uh, came in. That conversation happens against a backdrop of the South African developmental context. High levels of unemployment, um, high levels of poverty, one of the biggest Gini coefficients in the world. Um, so so all, of, all of those imperatives really drive the way that we need to locate our policy advice in South Africa. Another important area that we've been focusing on has also been around the South African priorities uh, in relation to the global biodiversity framework. In South, Af in South Africa, we've come to a set of uh, focal targets um, and business and biodiversity, resource mobilization, and generally speaking, mainstreaming work is our areas of focus for us. And I think that this has really helped raise the profile of this work as we've been doing it because there's been a lot of conversation happening around how we grapple with the business and biodiversity targets. So all that being said, um, I wanted to make two broad points um, about our approach to unlocking investment in biodiversity in South Africa um, and, and focal areas for uh, Sanbi's work. And the first of that is, is mainstreaming which really came out of a legacy where it has been assumed that biodiversity and development are in conflict with each other. And a big focal area for our work has been to make the case for biodiversity and development uh, through creating uh, knowledge products that improve decision making um, so that we can improve the way that landscapes are managed across the country. A lot of this has relied on our spatial mapping. Um, we, we, we speak about a three-way action plan for managing and conserving biodiversity, uh, focused on avoiding loss, protection, and restoration. Um, and over the past 15 years, we've created critical biodiversity area maps uh, across the country, which are updated regularly and are really a focal point for improved planning in the country. We also have a focus on creating resources for mainstreaming, um, which we've been developing periodically over the past 20 years, uh, starting with the mainstreaming biodiversity priorities. And most recently, we're developing a good practice guide for policy advice and mainstreaming, which will be released later this year. I've spoken a little bit about the critical biodiversity area maps and ecological support area maps which was quite a, a critical input uh, in the approach that we took to this working paper, which had an ecosystem focus. Uh, and we've also created technical guidelines, which means that across all the provinces and in all the catchments, the same approach is followed by different planners. Most recently, we've uh, done spatial delineation of strategic water source areas in South Africa, which are the 8% of the land that delivers 50% of South Africa's water. So these are, are spaces that are really important for our economy um, and has been an important input in the water security focus of the working paper. And then I think lastly, um, our kind of flagship knowledge product that we're now in the fourth iteration of is the National Biodiversity Assessment, um, which we're starting to develop a dashboard of across species and ecosystems so that we can have a live view of threat and protection level. So all this to say is that um, the approach that we have to mainstreaming and to spatial planning has had a, a real um, impact on the way that we approach the working paper, but also our mainstreaming lens has meant that uh, working collaboratively has been very important to the way that we uh, both develop the approach that was taken and the way that we kind of uh, 
uh, engage with validation and with creating final products that are useful for the right stakeholders. So we did this by creating a working group that uh, met every other week. Uh, we engaged with quite a wide range of technical e experts, both in the public and the private sector, so that we had the most up-to-date data, but also the way that the data was interpreted was fit for purpose. We also uh, used a mechanism that we call the Financial Mechanism Advisory Group, which has a wider range of stakeholders to check in with um, how the approach we were taking was landing for a group of stakeholders like that. And this also uh, kind of culminated in a series of policy dialogues, uh, which we had two of them were online and the last one was a kind of full day in person moment, which um, included the Department of Science and Innovation, National Treasury, the South African Reserve Bank, the Department of Water and Sanitation, Water Research Commission. So quite a, a powerful stakeholder group who, uh, if, if their uptake of this product is strong, will ensure that the work around, around nature-related financial risks and opportunity really lives on in various projects and in various government departments in South Africa. Um, and all that is to say that our approach has been that mainstreaming involves both the technical processes, which we're going to engage with most actively today, but also policy processes and processes involving institutions um, and, and social groups. And all of this needs to happen at the same time in order to create products that really have impact uh, in the South African context. Um, this work is very new. We're very excited about the progress we've made over the past year. And we're having some very solid conversations about how to, to create uh, a sustainable program of work around it. Um, we're, the feedback that we're getting from our initial engagements is that it's the, the way of speaking about water and biodiversity that um, this working paper has opened up really has traction with uh, stakeholders like National Treasury and the Reserve Bank. So there's a new kind of momentum in engaging in biodiversity issues, which I think is very pleasant, uh, present with climate, but not as much with biodiversity. So we're looking forward to the kind of platforms that have opened up just out of the policy engagements we've had over the past couple of months. Um, and, and we know that this work is very cross-sectoral um, and we're exploring the kind of sustained platform for engagement that could be unlocked out of this work so far. I think that is all from me, Antoine. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and thanks for a very interesting introduction. It, it really shows how um, we really at crossroads between both uh, producing uh, innovative research, but at the same time uh, um, feeding into a process of policy uh, engagement, which is extremely important, and especially in the case of biodiversity, given the complexity of dealing with biodiversity. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll now give the floor to Julien, uh, who's going to do a short introduction in the name of AFD, and then Paul will take over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Antoine, and thank you, everyone, for being with us. And thank you, Alex, for this introduction. I think you set the, the scene very well. We, we know where we are starting from. I, I, I took a, a few of, of the time to, to, to explain that this research uh, that we started with the, the South African partners is an attempt to contribute to the recent awareness of the need to assess the risk associated with biodiversity loss. As probably a lot of people uh, know, uh, several studies have been carried out in the Netherlands, in France, where we, see we participate, but also in Brazil, in Malaysia, for example. And then the NGFS has launched also a working group uh, uh, and published several documents, you know, the, the group of uh, central banks uh, on greening the financial systems. And these documents uh, are including a roadmap to improve the way financial regulators take this risk into account. Also, as you probably know, the TNFD has just published the, the fourth version of its framework to, for assessing risk and opportunity for companies and banks. And then, as uh, also Alex uh, put it, uh, the new uh, global biodiversity framework, which has been uh, negotiated at the, at the COP15, has a specific target 15, which calls on major transnational corporations and financial institutions to ensure that the, they monitor, assess, and disclose their biodiversity risk dependencies and impact in a transparent manner. So there is really a momentum 
to try to better to have better methodology and better you know uh, way to to assess this risk so what we have done with the, the support of Sanbi uh, and several stakeholders, key stakeholders in South Africa, is to try to, to develop this methodology. Most of the research carried out to date on risk has revealed uh, the exposure of economic activity, uh, uh, of uh, economic activity sectors to nature-related risk, but has done little to explore the territorial probability of shock occurring and of the risk material uh, materializing. So with this research, we have therefore developed two new methods uh, for assessing in greater depth the risk associated with the loss of biodiversity. The first, uh, we have gone beyond the purely sectoral analysis to attempt to identify the macro uh, financial nature of nature related risk. Uh, this is all we found that, for example, water related ecosystem services are the most important for South African economy, that more than 80% of export and 40% of consumer goods are heavily dependent on groundwater provision and the production processes that give rise to these dependencies have no su substitute for these ecosystem services at the moment. More than 1.2 trillion uh, rand, 24% of GDP of financial assets held by South African banks are highly dependent on ecosystem services for, uh, for groundwater provision. And then, so that that is the, the first, you know, example of uh, what we found out with this macro financial assessment. And then the second uh, real uh, innovation with this uh, study was to try to achieve uh, uh, the the identification of the location and the sectors of activity uh, of economic activity which are in a place where there is most likely a probability to be affected by the, the, the loss of nature. So this is where we, we, we found out that um, we were able to identify the provinces in South Africa most at risk with, from the disruption of groundwater supplies. This is, for example, Free State, Limpopo, Mumpalanga, Eastern Cape and Northwest province. In, in this province, the economic activity that depend on groundwater generate between 18 and 20% of tax revenue, 20, uh, 23 and 24% of consumer goods, and 10 to 20 uh, to 70% of jobs in these provinces. We found also that more than 60% of iron uh, ore mining operations, we are which are process processes with uh, with processes which are dependent on the ecosystem services of water provision, represent and represent uh 145 billions of uh, rand in loans are located particularly in municipalities sensitive to water shortage so this is where we have a better assessment of the risk and finally we can find also that 22 22 percent of south africa's export are produced in municipalities sensitive to water shortage so this is to to uh, to, to, to to demonstrate what is really uh, the, 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 the outcome of this uh, new uh, development. But I leave to Paul to present you these methods and, and, uh, and to the more precise results. Thank you, Julien. So now I will present uh, the methodology in more details and some specific results of the study. So first, um, the first idea of the methodology is to follow nature-related shock, what is uh, called nature-related shocks, throughout the economy and some indicators of macrofinancial stability. So first is to identify physical or transition shocks. Physical shocks, biodiversity-related physical shocks, are shocks related to the biophysical degradation of the environment and the biophysical consequences of this degradation. For example, when there are water shortage because of climate change, for example, this is a physical shock because a biophysical thing that is water is missing now. Transition shock is the other types of uh, biodiversity related shocks. And as for climate, it is related to changes in policy mostly, but also in uh, consumer behaviors or in technologies, so changes that is intending to mitigate the biodiversity pressure, the pressure that the economy is um, generated on biodiversity. So policy shock, for example, to forbidden to be uh, to forbid some kind of chemicals inputs in agricultural sectors, for example. So these are the two types of biodiversity related shocks. We assess 
the propagation of biodiversity related shocks through non-financial corporations or the industrial network to assess then different dimension of macro financial stability or socio-economic uh, stability for example wage and employment how those shock through the impact on non-financial institutions non-financial uh, corporation or the industrial network affects wage and employment for example or fiscal revenues or foreign currency generation so for this it is, it is important the impact on foreign on the capacity of the country to generate foreign currency through trade mostly we do not assess through capital flows but through the impact on the export industries mostly it will affect the capacity of the country to raise foreign currencies and then to import or to um, to comply with any international financial uh, liabilities we also assess consumption goods uh, vulnerability that is the sectors that are directly um, supplying goods and services to the, consume, the final consumers, the final consumers, and we take this as an index of the risk of inflation or physical or availability of products. So this is an important um, macro, macro, socio, and financial uh, index. And last, financial assets, financial assets like the assets owned by um south african banks in our case but we could assess other types of uh, financial assets i will come back on this later so this is the main the, the illustration of the analytical framework we are constructing to assess biodiversity related shocks on industrial network and on different types of socioeconomic variables this is a bit different than existing studies. Uh, if you look at only red edges, you can see that natural related risks and NRR are affecting productive structure. And most existing studies only have only assess the link between NNR, productive structure, and financial institutions. We in this study assess other macro financial indexes so we are going forward to assess country risk country risks that also affect financial institutions so one of the main one of the first main contribution of the study compared to other study is to assess the risk the risks for related to biodiversity related shocks to other for other types of um, economic dimensions than financial institutions per se. So, how do we do this? Um, the data and the methodological cornerstone of our study is input output analysis and more specifically, environmental ex environmentally extended input output analysis. This is illustrated through the, dif the different uh, square in the middle there. An input output table, the red squares here, relate to the, all the relationships that exist between all the sectors of an economy and all the sectors of other economy or abroad. So it is a multi regional input output table. So it, it allowed to give a map of how different industries are connected to other and what are the industries the most important in terms of production in a country. Additionally to that, the red squares as, um, inform us on environmental characteristics of different sectors. And those characteristics are of two types. You can have pressure characteristics, how much CO2 emissions, for example, each sector is, each sectors are uh, emitting. But you can also have some dependencies indicators, environmental indicators, how much an industry is dependent on water, for example. But only, but some indicators can be interpreted through both lens, through both through the lens of dependencies and through the lens of the pressures. And we can see, we, we will see later that it is important to, us to assess physical and, and transition risks. And the third kind of information that is uh, in, included in this kind of table are socioeconomic generation of 
uh, of the, the, the different sectors. How many labor is embedded in each sector? How much foreign currencies are those sectors generating each year? How much those sec each sector is supplying goods and services to uh, final consumer? So by combining all those informations, we can have a first map at the country scale, at the national scale of how different sectors are simultaneously vulnerable to biodiversity related sh shocks, physical or transition one, and simultaneously generating some important uh, macroeconomic and financial um, or containing uh, macroeconomic and financial uh, indicators. So important in a socioeconomic in a socioeconomic way. The second important feature of our methodology is uh, geospatial data. Geospatial data, as Julien said a bit before, will help us to localize uh, first nature-related shocks. For example, where are water missing? For example, what are the municipalities in which we um, in which there are water shortage or in which we plan there will be water shortage in the future because of climate change, for example. But it can be other kinds of uh, geolocalized information on the likelihood of nature related shocks. This we combine with information on the localization of economic activities. And for example, we can compare where are where is water where is water scarce to where are economic activities dependent on water. And when we localize, for example, a municipality where there are a lot of activities dependent on water and where there is uh, an high, a high risk of water, a water shortage, we conclude that this municipality and those activities are vulnerable. And then the socioeconomic indicators that those economic activities in those specific municipalities are generating. But I will come back more precisely on this. But just to, to, to sum up, a national scale systemic view on industries, uh, environmental pressure and dependencies, and socioeconomic generation, combined with a mapping, a geolocalized mapping, quite fine, of economic activities and nature related shocks. And this is related to um, an important conceptualization of vulnerability. What is vulnerability? Vulnerability in terms of biodiversity related shocks is a combination of three aspects of vulnerability. First, for an activity to be vulnerable to an, an, uh, biodiversity related shocks, the economic activity have to be exposed to a shock. For physical shock, it means that the economic activity has to be dependent on the ecosystem services on which it is reliant. For, ex a, for example, if you are in a country, if you are an industry that is using water and is dependent on water, you are exposed to a water-related shock. But if you have not, if you are not using water, you are not exposed. It is uh, evident. For transition risks. It is. It will be the impact of industries uh, you are pressuring. So, if an industry, if a sector is impacting biodiversity, it is potentially vulnerable to so exposed to some changes. For example, policy changes that will intend to mitigate the pressure you are doing on biodiversity. But the exposure is the aspect of vulnerability that have been the most and maybe the, the, the only aspect of vulnerability that have been studied in, ex, in uh, precedent studies. But another important aspect of vulnerability is the likelihood of shock. Because for example, if you are using and if you are dependent on water in Norway, for example, where water is uh, plenty, where there are plenty of water, you are not vulnerable to water shortage because <clears throat> Uh, as though you are you are using water, your environment is uh, uh, is providing you water, and so you are not vulnerable. So to specify the vulnerability of economic activities to biodiversity-related shock, you have to specify the likelihood of shock 
the high likelihood of water shortage, for example. If you are using water in Sudan, for example, you are much more vulnerable to water shortage than if you are using water in Norway because the likelihood of water shortage is important. And the last dimension, the last aspect of vulnerability is the sensibility or the ability to cope with or the adaptability, the adaptability of any agent. So we can think about different types of adaptive capacity, but for, for example, you can think about a financial adaptive capacity. If a bank is as some assets vulnerable to biodiversity related shocks, but has a lot of liquidity and reserve to be able to cope with the shock and to adapt, the bank itself will not be considered as vulnerable to the shock. So in order to um, well grasp the and well identify nature related shock, you have to combine ideally the, tr the three aspects of vulnerabilities that are likelihood of shock, exposure and sensibility. And this is closely related to the leap, to the so-called leap framework of the TNFD that differentiates what they call the locate uh, step phase, which is closely uh, the same as the likelihood of shock, a dimension of vulnerability, the evaluate stage, that is the evaluation of the impacts and the dependencies of uh, financial portfolio or economic activities toward biodiversity and assess is the phase that is related to the sensibility analysis, to the analysis of the ability of each agent to cope with any shock. And then the P of the of the of the TNFD framework is for prepare, but this is to yeah the recommendation. So last in terms of methodology, a map of the data that have been used. So on the left you can you, you we have data on the on the, sh the shocks themselves so more biophysical data so the anchor database for example is used to assess the dependencies of economic activities to 21 types of ecosystem services we have also the sunbees uh, map that i will present uh, afterward on threatened ecosystems on vegetation types but uh, and also the wwf water risk filter that help us to localize water shortage within South Africa. On the center, we combine those data with input-output data that I just mentioned before, and Quantec Easy Data regional data sets to map economic activities within the 230 municipalities of South Africa. So the national-wide economic activities are in the input-output database, and the localized economic activities information are related in the Quantec Easy Data regional data. And last, the socioeconomic uh, data, some are included in the input output database. So for example, for employment, etc., and for tax revenues, for example, or for exports, but other and mostly financial data are not included in the asset data, are not included in the input output table. So we rely on two types of, of data sets, the annual financial statistics provided by StatSA, so INSEE of uh, South Africa, and some internal uh, reserve bank uh, financial or data data of the banking uh, sector. So this is, this is all for the different data sets we combine. So now some, some results. Um, first, I will... I will pre present the result first in terms of physical risks and then in terms of transition risks. So this is a mapping, no, no worries if you don't see the, the different letters, no worries. This is a mapping of the dependencies of different industries that you can see on the bottom, primary sectors in green, uh, mining sectors, uh, agricultural sectors in green, mining sectors in black, manufacturing sectors and utilities in red and services sectors in blue. All those sectors are dependent at different degrees on 21 ecosystem services um, that are indicated on the Y axis. So for example, surface water on the top, but you have also, so 
provision services like surface water, but also regulation services such as uh, soil quality, water quality, climate regulation, fruit and storm protection, etc. So the Encore database provides a dependency scores assigned to each industries regarding the 21 ecosystem services. And this is a first map of how an economy is dependent on the 21 ecosystem services directly. I will come back on this later. This allows us to, to derive some first important results. So for example, half of South Africa's output production is produced by economic activities highly dependent on at least two different ecosystem services, so half. 70% of the value of the goods consumed by households are produced by activities highly dependent on at least one ecosystem services. This means that the degradation of ecosystem services has a high probability to affect sectors that directly supply goods and services to final uh, consumer. Then an important risk of a shortage in terms of price inflation or quantity availability. Last but not least, 80% of net exports are generated in sector highly dependent on at least two ecosystem services. This is certainly the most striking result. And this is because the South African economy, in terms of exports, rely on much more primary sectors, such as mining sectors and some manufacturing sectors that are really using uh, notably water. So the sectors in South Africa that are generating most of the exports, here 80 percent, are highly dependent on at least two ecosystem services. So now the question is what types of ecosystem services are concerned, because not all ecosystem services are concerned on the same uh, importance. So for example, 80 percent of the South African net exports are generated specifically by activities that are highly dependent on surface water specifically. So it's no more every uh, so ecosystem services. Now we are focusing on specific ones and we know that 80% well, we derive that 80% of the South African net export are generated by activities highly dependent on surface water, but also 88% uh, on groundwater and 75% on flow maintenance, uh, water flow maintenance. This is a water flow maintenance. <laughs> 54% um, of the goods consumed by households are produced by activities highly dependent on fluid and store protection. So we, we could interpret it as that some important fluids could quite directly uh, imply inflation and uh, goods uh, shortage because 54% of the goods consumed by households are produced by activities highly dependent on fluid and storm protection. And uh, for another, uh, and for production, yeah, 30 percent, 38% of uh, the economy in terms of production is highly dependent on surface waters specifically. Now, in terms of finance uh, for banks, we derive that more than uh, 1.2. Uh, 1,200 billion of assets held by South African banking system, banking sector, are issued by activities that are highly dependent on surface and groundwater. So a surface and groundwater shortage could imply financial risks. It is the main, uh, and specifically the exposure of the South African banks to water shortage is through activities in specific sectors, notab notably in agricultural sectors, mining sector, manufacturing, and utilities as well real estates. So we can map what types of ecosystem services are concerned, but also what types of sectors are concerned are concerned in the vulnerability of the banking system to biodiversity related shocks. But though the present figures was also was only concerning the direct dependencies of sectors. But thanks to the input output data set that I mentioned that the input output data sets integrates all the relationships that exist between the industries that use and sell intermediate products to others, we can assess the indirect dependencies of different sectors. And that is the, the, the dependencies that are through the use and the selling of 
intermediate products. For example, if I'm the manufacturing one sector here, I'm using some raw materials produced by the agricultural sectors, for example. I'm not directly dependent on the pollination services, for example, the pollination uh, ecosystem services, for example, but I'm indirectly dependent on these services because if pollination, the pollination service degrade, degrade itself, the agricultural sector will suffer from it. And then I will indirectly suffer from the, the shock through increase in price, for example, uh, increase in, in agricultural price or maybe even um, quantity shortage. But it is not only through the use of input that you are indirectly exposed, you are also your cells uh, can be also exposed if the agricultural sector on the center is not producing anymore because pollination services do not exist it will not uh, use any machine anymore so it will not purchase any other machine that's another sector let's say the manufacturing too is producing but it's not only the first round supply effect we can also assess the indirect round some inf infinity uh, infinite rounds of effects from manufacturing to manufacturing to do services sectors, for example, that could be also affected by an ecosystem services on which all, only some primary sector will lie. So in terms of uh, indirect dependencies, this is the map you already know. And this is the new map with uh, a calculation of indirect dependencies. So just for the comparison, here you have on mostly the left hand of the map that is uh, quite red, that is agricultural sector that, that are mostly dependent on ecosystem services. Some services such as surface water are widely uh, important for different sectors, but you have mostly these left uh, red panels of sectors. And when we are computing indirect dependency scores, the first impression is that a lot of sectors and almost every sectors become dependent on at least one ecosystem services and notably here at the middle where you see a lot of yellow it is the food agro it is the food industries that are a lot um, that are relying on agricultural input a lot so their inputs are, are mostly um, agricultural products so they are highly indirectly dependent on ecosystem services. So this is a map of indirect dependencies within uh, the, South African, the South African economy, given the industries interlinkages that exist between in the different industries. Um, yeah. So this is, and in terms of indirect linkages, we can, in the in the indirect dependencies and indirect exposure to physical shocks, we can derive plenty of results, but I, I, but this example uh, related to water provision. So what, for example, for water provision, trade, finance, business services, and, constru and construction, construction sectors that are not considered as highly dependent on surface water are indirectly dependent on water because through direct linkages or indirect linkages with industries that are directly dependent on water. And to finish on this, this as uh, I didn't put some result here, but for this has important implication for socioeconomic uh, consequences because primary sectors are not uh, generating a lot of socioeconomic uh, indicators, for example, uh, exports, etc. But other sectors that are in fact indirectly dependent on ecosystem services can be important generation the generator of uh, and of macro and financial uh, index variables. So to finish on physical risk, we go through the we go to the um, spatial analysis. So the spatial the spatially explicit assessment of economic vulnerability to water shortage. So first we we are looking at the water shortage risk of each municipalities that are. 230 municipalities. So we rely on the, the water risk filter of, produced by the WWF. But you can see that different parts of South Africa are not uh, evenly uh, vulnerable 
to water shortage. And what we do is to com we compare where is water shortage with where are economic activities dependent on uh, water. And so on your left, you have the water shortage risk score. And on your right, you have the production by sectors uh, highly dependent on surface water uh, in terms of uh, this size. So from this, you can not you, you cannot derive anything, but with with some figures, we derive that ten percent of South African total production is vulnerable to water shortage, and this means that ten percent of the production is produced by activities that are highly dependent on water, and simultaneously located in a municipality that is sensitive to water shortage or critical to water shortage. So we go from 30, uh, 38% of exposure of sectors that are only dependent on water to 10% of sectors of production that is highly dependent on water and located in critical or sensitive municipalities. In terms of exports, we go from the 80% of uh, before to 22% of exports that are vulnerable to water shortage. So that are sectors that are highly dependent on water and located in municipalities sensitive to water shortage. So we can map where are and in what industries are the um, exports that are vulnerable to water shortage. So we go from 80% to 22% of exports vulnerable and locally identified uh, vulnerable to water shortage. Hence, we can compare different provinces, for example, more than 20% of tax uh, paid in Free State, Limpopo, and Pumalanga, and Eastern Cape are by activities vulnerable to water shortage, so highly dependent and located in water sensitive municipalities. Uh, and for Free State and Mpumalanga, the problem is more jobs, where uh, 17 and 15 percent of jobs are vulnerable to water shortage. Then about finance, uh, we derive that the South African the South African banking sector holds 145 billion in credit loans issues issued by the um, mining of iron industries. Yet the mining of iron industries is located at 60% in water shortage critical municipalities, and these sectors is reliant on water. So one important channel for, for banking stability in South Africa is through water shortage, through iron and copper mining to the banking system for physical shock related to water to translate into physical, into financial risk. So this was for dependencies uh, and so for physical risks. This was a panel of results for physical risks, but we also do the job so related to the dependencies of economic activities to ecosystem services. But we also produce some results for transition risks that are related to the impacts um, of economic activities on biodiversity. So I will present some results now. So we rely we rely on uh, different types of biodiversity relevant pressure. So biodiversity relevant pressures are the main pressures that have been identified by scientists, notably by the IPBOS, as the main pressures responsible for biodiversity loss in the world. So four and in fact, five main types of um, biodiversity relevant pressure, pressures have been identified. So on your left, you climate change, then land use, pollution, pollutants, and resource extractions. One another is invasive species, but I let it apart because it's really difficult to assess. But it is an important pressure on biodiversity are invasive species. But we concentrate on climate change related pressures, land use related pressures, pollution related pressures, and resource extractions related pressures. What you can see here are the sectors distributions of those pressures in South Africa. So for example, if you look at your left, the CO2 pressure is mostly realized by the electric power generation sectors 
that are mostly generation generated by coal in South Africa. So it's not surprised. It's, it's not surprising. For land use related um, pressures, so we different crop related, related land use, land use, forest related land use, and pasture related land use. You can see different sectors responsible for this pressure in South Africa specifically. So, for example, for cropland use, growing maize and raising of sheep, raising of cattle, growing wheat are the most important sectors responsible for the cropland use. And for example, for forest land use, you have the first tree and logging sector uh, uniquely. For pollutant, then we are um, looking at two types of pollution related to eutrophication and acidification. So uh, we look at different types of pollutants and we find different sectors, again, responsible for this pressure. And here we can see that the electrical power section uh, sector is again important for another types of pressure, not only climate change, but here for some, some specific type of acidification related pollutants. And then, and last, for the resource extraction, we differentiate fishing that is only uh, realized by the fishing industries and blue water consumption, which is mostly realized by harvesting sectors such as uh, growing leg leguminous, uh, and other agricultural sectors. So this is a map of how different sectors are responsible for biodiversity relevant biodiversity pressures in South Africa. But we, you cannot derive directly some socioeconomic, socioeconomic exposure from this map. You have to specify key sectors or critical sectors uh, relative to those pressures. So what it's what we did. Uh, based on specific assumption and specific results on those pressures but we identify different sectors that are key sectors for different pressures for example key sectors for climate change pressures are the electrical sectors the coke and oven sectors and some others key sectors for land use related pressures are some agricultural are mostly some agricultural sectors key sectors for pollution are some primary sectors and some manufacturing sectors but this will help you this will help us to identify the content and to calculate the macroeconomic content or generation of those sectors and the intuition insight here is to say that if a government for example or some cons or some consumer want to mitigate the pressure they will probably affect the production of those key sectors and then those socioeconomic variables are vulnerable to transition risks. So, for example, key sectors for water use furnish 7% of household demand. So, if tomorrow you, you regulate a lot of water use, it could have an impact on the capacity of the sectors that directly furnish goods and services to um, finance sectors. To yeah. so it will certain it could affect a price, uh, final good price and uh, availability. Other result case sectors for acidification related pollutants generate 9% of exports. So exports are as well uh, vulnerable to transition shocks, not only physical shocks. Case sectors for cropland, cropland use uh, employed 3.5% of jobs. So one important thing to have in mind when you are looking at biodiversity related risk is that Concerning the agricultural sectors, it's mostly labor that is directly uh, vulnerable. And here, key sector for cropland use employ 3.5% 3 of jobs uh, in South Africa. So for banks now, uh, we'll go at pollution directly. For example, pollutant related key sectors have 100.9 billion um, uh, runs in assets held by the banking system. So the banking system is vulnerable to change in policy related to mitigation of pollutants through different uh, sectors at this amount. And last, water-related care sectors have 237 billion in assets held by the banking system. Then regulating uh, or any changes, uh, any changes to make water more wisely consumed could, in some way, you have to be clever. You have to be smart in regulating water in terms of financial stability. And then, and last, in terms of results, the spatially explicit assessment of specific types of transition shocks. 
So in terms of uh, geolocalized data on transition shocks, we gathered, thanks to Senbi, data on the localization of threatened ecosystems, and more specifically, on threatened vegetation types. So we have a map, really fine map, of where and what are the different types of vegetations that are threatened uh, in South Africa. And our implicit scenario, our implicit transition scenario, is the following. And governments want to protect threatened vegetations in South Africa. But in addition to this, how we will do it if you want, if you want to regulate it? We want to uh, regulate the activities that are responsible for the pressures uh, affecting those ecosystems. So we have, we have to gather two types of data. First, the where are ecosystems threatened? And what types of pressures of pressures are threatening those ecosystems? So Senbi, in addition to pro to produce information on where are threatened ecosystems, they also produce information on the types of pressures that are affecting those ecosystems. And first, we will we will focus on mining's related pressures. So we know that in those municipalities we have some ecosystem threatened, so in danger of extinction. And we know that as they are threatened by mining activities specifically. So what we do, and this is uh, parallel to what we did for water shortage municipal assessment, is to compare the threatened, the mining related threatening of ecosystems with the location of mining activities in South Africa to derive some figure on what would imply some regulation of mining activities in the place where there are threatening, threatening uh, vegetation types. So, for example, we find that 48% uh, of mining production locate in municipalities highly covered by mining threatened ecosystems. That is what we call sensitive municipalities, because municipalities where the probability of uh, mitigation policy are high because they are highly covered by uh, mining threatened ecosystems. So almost half of mining activities are located in some places where that are highly covered by ecosystems threatened by mining activities. But because different types of mining activities are not evenly distributed across the countries, different mining sectors are more or less vulnerable to transition to reduced uh, threats on ecosystems. And what we find, an interesting result, is that 80% of coal mining activities, specifically coal mining, is located in the municipalities that are highly uh, covered by um, threatened ecosystems. And this identify a clear overlap with the climate issue, because what we find is that in South Africa specifically, at least, coal mining is both threatened climate and some specific uh, vegetation types. And for example, gold mining is really less exposed to, to this kind of shock because the localization of mining of gold mines are less uh, um, around uh, threatened ecosystems. So some results on banking system. The banking, as I said before, is highly exposed to iron and coal mining, but also slightly to coal mining. So the banking system could be affected to uh, by some transition shocks affecting uh, mining's threatened threatening ecosystems. We also did a similar exercise on agriculture uh, with information on the localization of agriculture and the localization of specific ecosystems uh, threatened by agricultures. But as we cannot differentiate different types of agricultural activities on this uh, locally on this municipal scale, it's less interesting. So I'll spend it for later. Just to know that uh, to finish on uh, on the opportunity side, what could be important for for a government or any planning entities is to identify what kind of activities could be even like less impacting biodiversity, but even maybe good for biodiversity. And we take the example of conservation agriculture when well, we, we could uh, look at 
where are conservation agriculture occurring versus where are ecosystems threatened to have like an economic ecological planning in mind where you uh, you be cautious about the two types of um, of index uh, i will finish here um, so just to conclude we assessed physical and transition shocks uh, those shocks have systemic impact, systemic potential impact on South Africa, notably through inflationary pressure and external imbalances, and as well as a financial level. Uh, and we, we provided some specific results on uh, on a quite fine geolocal geolocalized scale. Thank you very much. Please, Yuval. Thank you, um, Paul. And yes, I leave the floor to, to Yuval um, to comment. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you, Paul. And thanks, um, Antoine. And hello to everyone. Um, Yuval Chechik here. I am a advisor to the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. Um, I lead the work on issues of resource mobilization and the biodiversity finance initiative for the country. And I've also been involved in some of the COP negotiations, and I have an interest in, in, in the targets on mainstreaming and obviously the resource mobilization targets sitting in the global biodiversity framework, sort of target 14 up to target 19. So this work is, is really emergent, relevant, um, well-placed. Um, it's been a, a very interesting and, and rewarding journey actually working, working on this piece, mainly seeing the interest that it's galvanized from the sector as we've as we've approached um, through the through the consults and as we've approached having a, a product that we can present. Um, so really, um, I want to talk to to kind of two areas of relevance. I think um, I've already been touched on by Alex, but maybe just to underline that you know, where this work fits in is really around strengthening the overall case um, for biodiversity for South Africa. And I think that, that that in itself is an important policy context that helps strengthen many of the existing programs of work that we have um, in and around the branch and that are emerging as a result of the global biodiversity framework. Um, but many of these programs need domestication and implementation by other ministries. So this is an ongoing challenge. Um, I'm sure it's a challenge in other ministries and governments around the world. Certainly it's a challenge in South Africa um, where you know you have competing developmental priorities, um, and obviously you know the Department of Environment sees things one way, but but I guess to talk the right language intergovernmentally is is the challenge. And the second really is around how we approach implementation of the global biodiversity framework, especially around the targets on the ambitious targets on resource mobilization, and and the fact that we 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 acknowledge that. The, the, the approach is around all sources and the private sector has got a very important role to play, the business sector in that. So really in, the, in, the, in respect of the business for biodiversity, the business case for biodiversity, um, I think the study presents a very sector-centered um, view on the impacts of declining biodiversity. Um, and I feel that although there might be a basic anecdotal understanding um, that in a country like South Africa, which is very resource extractive, um, there's obviously great risk in biodiversity ecosystem loss. Um, I think at the level of detail that we've provided here, um, especially in that they link to kind of location specific, spatially explicit um, data, and obviously the, the output being this impact on socioeconomic indicators. I'm trying to recall that, that graph, Paul. Um, but I think that's very compelling. Um, Julian gave an example, or Paul at the end reaffirmed that the 22% of South African exports are produced in areas that are, are water sensitive. Um, there's other, there's many, many different levels of detail. I, I noted now the, the detail on the likelihood of shocks that you presented, um, Paul, and also the, the, the complexity in around the direct and indirect dependencies and those linkages to physical risk. Um, 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 you know, the, the level of complexity that this, that, that this research can provide is, is, really, is really quite new. Um, and I think we can, you know, double click down any of those areas um, depending on the need. So really, really, it's just a window into, into what's, what's possible. And what this does is it, it, overall it, it helps to create a better overarching understanding of, of ecosystem loss and what that means um, to, to our economic sectors. 
And we're really trying to, to make that better understood in the same way that climate is understood and treated within government. Um, climate as a, as a policy issue has been around for many years. Um, actually, in South Africa, we've got an established government structure that looks to coordinate intergovernmentally around issues of climate, the Presidential um, Commission for Climate. Um, and we don't have a similar or equivalent structure for biodiversity um, that actually looks to integrate, you know, um, biodiversity related economic data, impact threats into policy. So this is really, this really um, is emerging and it helps us then to work with, you know, the, 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 the main players, the central banks, other agencies, all collectively responsible to implement South Africa's national development plan um, and, and I guess compel them to be more active and to, I guess, integrate these issues into their decision-making and policy. Um, and, and this being quite a fact-driven economic, you know, lens um, research paper, I think that's easier, frankly, easier to communicate. Um, and we're already seeing that this research is unlocking those conversations I mentioned at the beginning. And Alex mentioned a few of the key stakeholders. You know, we, 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 this has really created um, very good conversations with the South African Reserve Bank, the Development Bank of SA, um, our colleagues who operate in the water sector, and obviously the Central Bank National Treasury. Um, I mean, just, just a few more words on, on the global biodiversity framework, um, and especially around those, those kind of targets um, that we're all kind of thinking in in, in our approach now. Um, like I said, we our approach is, is around all sources. The, the private sector role is key, and we're in the process now of developing a business for biodiversity program. Um, which really is the approach of, of how to integrate um, issues of biodiversity into the sector. Um, disclosures is one area. Obviously, um, we, we've, got, we've got other incentives and, and other roles in resource mobilization that we're looking for from, from the business sector more broadly. So it's really how, how do we encourage the private sector to play a more positive role in sustainability and conservation in the country? Um, and I think that this research is really well placed to support that objective, um, especially by creating an understanding of, of how the private sector interacts, um, depends on um, biodiversity, and, and that will then allow them to create um, initiatives and put those into place for better sustainable use of those ecosystem services, which, which obviously then presents um, you know, the opportunities that, that we spoke about. Um, we haven't yet fully operationalized the TNFD program in the country, uh, but the, I think this work is is sitting really strong to support um, that implementation in the future, and it marries very well with existing initiatives that we have. Um, for example, the Green Taxonomy work recently published um, by National Treasury in the in, that sits in the broader sustainable financing framework for the country. We've got an ongoing program of natural capital accounts. That our, our colleagues at, at Stats is say the statistical body of South Africa leads, and we've got other programs. Um, Alex mentioned some of them. The EI for water security. Um, there's there's a program on on the Encore indicator group, which is coming now, and I think that all of all of I think that that, that this research um, helps to to kind of centralise and align some of those pieces of work. Um, and actually, we we are already looking at a kind of continuation of this work. Um, where the Jeff 8 window is now open. Um, we, we are busy packaging some of our um, business for biodiversity program into that into to be supported by Jeff. And um, this work has already found found a home within that program for further development. Um, and we would obviously be guided sectorally and and intergovernmentally around how to develop that. Uh, but I think that this is just a, a glimpse in a window. So yeah, those are just a few comments. Thanks very much for the opportunity and uh, back to you, Paul. Thank you, um, Yuval. Um, I will now give the floor to um, uh, uh, Julie Clark, who's an environmental analyst at the Development Bank of South Africa. Uh, Julie, thank you for being here and, and looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. I'm gonna be very extreme brief. Um, just about three quick slides for three quick points. So I wanted to say DBSA is on a journey like most banks are, and it comes in patches and it comes in spurts. And this AFD study was not a spurt. It was a magnificent landing of a round peg in a round hole. 
it was exactly plugging a gap that we were battling with and it saved us the time where we would have to find these resources which we don't really have that kind of resources we are we are like most banks under capacitated and um, we need to improve that but to improve that is a big step and and that big step was partially plugged by this AFD study. So we, we have started our journey with IDFC, helping us with policy positions, with TNFD, helping us with critical frameworks. And now we know what the journey is about. Then we've got beautiful support networks of other critical players. Some of them you've, you've listened to today. We have had amazing inputs from the WWF water filter. And then the Encore partnership has been instrumental. And then the Sanby Jeff EI for water security program that then coupled with AFD to, to present some of the studies today was magnificent. And ultimately, we've learned some lessons. So that's really been our journey to put it into context. But we, we have what we've done is borrow as much as we can from the AFD study because it saved us doing all of that. And now what the bank really wants to know is, well, what is material to the bank and what is relevant particularly for us and for our business. And now we've got the baselines and we've got all the theory and we've got the methodology and we've got all the technical wad of stuff and it's all you know, grounded in good methodology. That's a fantastic leap forward. Now, now what we really wanna know, so, so, so what? So what for DBSA? So now we were trying to piggyback on that methodology but we didn't quite know how. So this was our first little effort to do a a study similar to what AFD did and do a heat map. So we didn't know that there was a technology. So you can have a good laugh silently at our expense there. But we just took DBSA sectors and we took them against, as you've seen before, the the most relevant ecosystem services and we came up. So what are the sectors DBSA should really look at if we, we can't do everything all at once. If we're going to focus, it's already telling us what to focus on in terms of the ecosystem services and in terms of the sectors. And that's just for the direct, but then there's also the indirect and so on and so on. You've heard it all, physical, transitional impact and dependencies. So we can move on to the next one very quickly. So that was our first effort. And this is similar, just giving an idea to us, to all of us in the bank, what are the ecosystem services that we that, that, that each sector is, is dependent on and how can we bring that better into our appraisals and responses and our credit risk and how can we apply that into our conditionalities and asking for special terms and conditions around these things. And just we've always been trying to do it, but we've never had a scientific or an economic grounding for it. And that's the difference now. Okay, so moving on to the last slide. Our challenges in, in, in now applying AFD study into our work was just matching sectors and ecosystem services because uncle has got one set, IPPS has got another, we've got another. And so when we go forward, it would be really nice if we can if we can get a better sector analysis breakdown that more links with the green taxonomy and sustainable finance drives, and then that would really help the world and really help Africa and really help us. And then um, in terms of the database, we, we loved South Africa because of Sandy. Sandy was amazing in terms of getting all of these maps, some of which came through the Jeff and DBSA program, but what we really need now is that same level of detail for Africa, and we really have to get it fast. Then recreating the RGB, that's, you know, the heat map and, and the scale. Well, sorry, we really fell short there because we didn't really realize you have to download special um, bits, some special software, and so we didn't have it. So we did very amateur ones, but it didn't matter that the thought process was there. And we'll do a beautiful one for the next presentation. And then the translation from getting, okay, so this is what it is. And now this is the target we're going to go for. And this is the ambition that we want to drive. And this is how we're going to get there. I didn't bring any of that into this because that's another story. So the lessons learned was everything is reiterative and modular. And so don't be afraid to start anywhere. Doesn't matter where, just start somewhere. And then the power of partnerships is great. And it's two ways. I think even as a small under-resourced bank, we were helping to, in many of these drives, even if it was just to test it and apply it and say whether it was relevant or not, or what would work for us and what would shift the needle from the way we're doing things now, everything has been undermined. 
every transaction undermines nature and we want to switch that needle the other way around so every transaction benefits nature and restores nature so what will make that switch and that's where testing things like this macroeconomic study could be a very valuable role that we could play so going forward partnerships and a provider pool service provider pool could assist because having access to two people like the AFD have employed, like you've just heard from today, how empowering was that for us? It was incredible. And I don't know how any bank would do it without them. And then African banks would also benefit from like an, a special African tool that goes into the sectors and goes into the high, I mean, mining, yes, and agriculture, yes, but infrastructure is huge. It's got a massive direct and indirect impact and dependency across Africa because it's that is what opens up the mining and the other the other um, ex export or extractive industries. So so we need to really have something that's totally relevant to Africa's crises on various levels and whatever. And then the scope of the AFD study from South Africa to other places that need it would be very valuable. I wish for other countries to have what AFD has done, but of course they couldn't do it without a Sandby as well in each of those countries. So somehow technical assistance going into those countries to get these maps out would be very valuable. And then addressing infrastructure risks as a key risk sector needs to be done urgently for Africa and linking the sectors to the emerging green taxonomies. I'd like to say that most of this could be could be fast tracked a lot with also an AFD website. You know, that would really help us because then it would save a lot of people that, and we could also input into that to save people struggling in the journey as we have struggled at certain sticking points that were hard for us to jump over. And that's the value of, of such a, a resource. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, uh, indeed. Um, so, um, uh, all right, so so there has been a few questions uh, uh, in the chat, but most of them have been answered. Let me just have a, a quick summary on my end, uh, um, and I think we can stop the sharing. The, I'll stop sharing the screen, and, and up we can go back to the um, to the to the group uh, discussion here. So so I think two two points uh, two two outcomes stand out of this study. First one is that there is already a lot of data. Uh, of course, South Africa is is particularly privileged, uh, and 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 the, the quality of the data provided by Sanbi, but others as well, is uh, study say and, and and so on has been tremendously helpful. But this also shows that we can already try to do some preliminary assessment of the risks and opportunities in biodiversity without the need of large scale models. And I know that I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot because I love doing large scale models. But in the end, I think that that uh, it's not necessary. And we can already do some some very good preliminary work, which can tell already a lot of interesting stuff uh, and start the discussion. Because and this is the second most important outcome of this uh, of this, this study. And, and Julie was also mentioning it is what we need to start doing is building a common language between uh, economists, financial investors, ecologues, biodiversity experts, um, because it's 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 uh, somewhat uh, complex to uh, to understand and grasp all of the uh, diversity and the multidimensionality of biodiversity, but it is possible. Possible. And 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 in in a way, the the the, the study that, that has been presented today allows already to start the discussion and to show okay why is it important for me to look at biodiversity? What are the relevant transmission channels that are important for us? And as you keep on discussing, well, the the overall awareness of the importance of biodiversity in economics in general, but also in social socioeconomic aspects, is is uh, emerging uh, stronger and stronger, both in terms of risk, as has been highlighted today, but also in terms of opportunities. Can we we change practices so that we actually reduce the pressure we exert on biodiversity? Can we change practices so that we reduce the dependency we have on biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services? And, and so uh, for development banks such as AFD and DBSA, it's also tremendously helpful to be able to identify where are the key sectors that we need to act upon and change so that we actually uh, reduce the pressure and the dependencies. Um, right, so so this is me just trying to summarize uh, the, the study, but let me go back to the, to the question. So the way three types of questions, uh, a few questions related to the data set, uh, uh, like uh, how do you deal with NCORE and the, and the lack of uh, uh, NA uh, for, for specific uh, sectors? Uh, how do we deal with uh, the idea of highly dependent and, and non-dependent? And also a, second, a third question from Romain uh, on, on uh, uh, the trick of, of having the, the right scale and the level of accuracy. So I know that Julien has already answered 
them in the, in the chat but maybe Julien, you want to you want to have a, a first uh, uh, go and then maybe Paul and, and others can 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 jump in if if they want to yeah uh, i i'm not sure i uh, this is very complex questions but uh, first yes uh, the, the, the the one very important point is to say that is the 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 the, the questions from uh, from uh, from Beatrice Boarolo. Yes, Angkor is completely uh, blind on several dimensions. So all the figures here are only indications. Uh, they are you know uh, uh, low estimates, uh, and they are just opening the door of where th there seems to, to to be some some area of uh, interest where discussion should happen to try to, to do something. Uh, and this is the, the idea. Uh, the questions of, uh, of Roman about the, the scale is about also, it's also, also a bit the, the same. We provide a very, uh, you know, global estimate at national level. We try to localize where in the country, you know, uh, the, the, the dependencies and the likelihood of shocks or, or what are the pressure and what are the threats particularly linked to this pressure are happening in the country. But then, you know, the discussions about is it relevant, uh, what can be done, where do we start first and so on, it's really up to the stakeholders and to the local decision makers to, to find the best way to, to, to operate. Uh, so I, I, see, I see this as being, you know, a background, a background science to help the discussions, to, to, to back, to back, the, to back the, the, the discussion, but knowing that it's completely, you know, uh, estimates the, that we lack some dimensions and we need to be very cautious to, with the with the with the figures. Don't 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 look too much at the the zero after the after the, after the figures uh, or the the precisions. You know, it's really the the, the yeah the, the number the big numbers who are interesting, uh, and this is what is very key. I will say. Thank you, Julien. I don't know if uh, you, Val, Alex, or Paul, or, or Julie, you want to comment on, on further on this on this uh, data issue. Not so much. No. Um, I'll then move on to uh, to two questions which were related to the management. Uh, uh, well, uh, of like so, there was two questions: uh, how to manage political change in relation to environmental and social management, and the second one was more uh, how to manage great politics in nature domains and and change in relation to the environment and social management. And so, so I I know that uh, Alex, you already had a first go at this. I don't know if you want to comment further on on the the response you provided, or or not. Um, maybe just to say, I think in one of my comments, I said that we can't manage politics, you know, that, um, and you will go crazy trying to do so. And, and what we can do is ensure that we've got transdisciplinary teams who have an understanding both about the, the, the science and the technical elements, but who also understand the political landscape into which we're working and are able to craft knowledge products and messages and uh, even platforms that ensures that you're optimizing the chance of uptake. Um, and what we're wanting to create are trusted, evidence-based uh, pieces of work that transcend political eras. Uh, South Africa heads into uh, another, another political era next year. So they'll, we've got uh, elections. And we want to know that the, the pieces of work that we do have been validated in such a way across various experts and sectors that it's, it's clear that the science is solid. And this is the, the piece of work that should guide decision-making and planning. So I think, I think that's a big area of focus. And the, the second area of focus is that as, as public servants, it's really important to create um, kind of resilient and thick relational networks in the sectors that you want to work with, um, because yeah, people come and goes. You you need to have multiple channels of communication uh, in strategic spaces, so that if somebody moves to a different space, that there are other people that you can call. So, um, you know, and these are these are lessons that we've learned through kind of twenty years of mainstreaming in Sanbi, um, and it takes time. I think is is also the big takeaway that uh, don't expect an evolution in practice and process uh, over a couple of years. It takes kind of a, a minimum of seven to ten years to really change systems, um, and so allow yourself that time to to create sustained change. 
Thank you, Alex. I don't know if anyone else wants to um, jump in here. Not necessarily. Um, the the last well, there's two more questions. Sorry, uh, one which relates to um, the framework we use to um, uh, uh, define vulnerability. And so the the question by Adrien Comte, who was saying, well, the the IPCC defines three dimension exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, which is somewhat different from from our framework. I I tried to answer by by saying that what we do is actually we distinguish the exposure part of the IPCC into two: the likelihood of the shock to happen and then the exposure to when a shock happens. Um, and then, of course, we combined the, the sensitivity and adaptive capacity into our sensibility, which has a combination of both direct response, like, like what happens when, when you have, when you are directly hit by the shock and the sensitivity of, of your economy or your activities onto the specific shock. And then a, a long term, uh, how much are you able to change? Uh, that is the adaptive capacity, which we mingle together into the sensibility. Or actually, rather, we didn't really concentrate. We didn't really talk about the long term. But I don't know, Paul, if you want to add something about that. Um, no, I yet. think you made a good response here. OK. And then the final question, which is uh, uh, more direct. Uh, what about the possible AFD contribution to the lower coal use in South Africa? Any co-investments in renewables? I, I will um, gladly not respond to that question <laughs> directly, um, but but uh, the, I'm sure that my colleagues in the uh, in the energy department, uh, uh, of course, I mean, so, uh, AFD is committed to to uh, to address the energy transition program in, in, in South Africa with a clear des uh, desire to, of course, reduce the CO2 emissions and, and, and coal, of course, is one of the key issues, uh, aware that also it has uh, strong repercussion, socio uh, uh, repercussion there. And so, so, so um, there's, there's, I mean, this is, this is clearly the work that, that AFD does, but I, I don't uh, personally, uh, from, from my point of view, we don't have a direct answer to the, to the, to the, to that, that, that question. Uh, I don't know, Julien, if you want to add something. No, yeah, we were being very cautious, of, of course, but to answer uh, Dominique uh, questions, which is from uh, energy, uh, company in France, uh, uh, f you know, what we, we hope in a sense is to, to, we wait for the, for the answers and the decision from the government in a sense, which are very key. You, as you can Im imagine, you know, we can only do things, uh, to support the decision of the, of the South African government. So again, our, our expectation with this work and, and, uh, and with the, with the, 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 the partnership that we have, we have built with the, with the South African partners is that they have the, 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 the science to take decision because of as you can imagine it's a very tough de decision to know what to do then when there is a clear decision and the request to support the uh, direction a trajectory uh, you know uh, some 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 yeah some investment to to be made then this is where we we, we are able uh, or at least our, our colleagues are able to at the at the at the operation i would say are able to support you know the the, the decision of the South African. So this is really where we, we 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 see our position at the moment, and this is why we are we will not answer your question at the moment because this is really in the end of the South African. Uh, and and but that we expect that uh, th with this partnership we help to take decisions and and to know what what can be done and how to do it. Thank you, Julien. And then as a last question, we have three minutes left, two minutes left by Alberto. Uh, could the interaction between climate change, increase of intensity and frequency of droughts, for example, a nature related risk reduction of water provision be a potential source of systemic financial risk? Has this interaction been already explored in, in, in your work? Um, I don't know if Paul or Julien, I have an answer otherwise, but I'll, I'll I'll give a quick answer. So, yeah. so technically, in in the current situation, it's a snapshot. So we don't uh, consider t a, t a, a climate change because it's the it's the current situation, and we explain the dependency to water shortage, and we can nonetheless identify in which municipalities are uh, the the risk while well, the water provision already has been degraded. Uh, however, we we cannot. We haven't included a scenario building where uh, the evolution of climate would make certain municipalities worse off than now. It is something that technically would be possible uh, uh, by using the different RCP scenarios and looking at the consequences in terms of uh, of climate uh, evolution uh, uh, there. Um, but but we haven't done it, and and we would need to have a, a, a further assessment of how much 
the well how would the, the provision of water services evolve as uh, climate change uh, 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 evolves itself um, including uh, uh, thinking about the water uh, provisioning uh, in, into the different basins and so on and so forth so so it technically it is possible we haven't done it yet um, um, and it depends on on yeah, I guess the, the, there are different ways in which doing it, and, and and how much time we are willing to dedicate to the to the question. But but certainly this is something that has uh, that came to our mind when we were discussing the, the study with Alex and Yuval as well. Um, so yeah, this is something and, that. We, and, yeah. and and just to finish to to add to to, add to, to the fact that again the, the idea with this study and the snapshot is to show that you can start to do things without waiting for this very developed and complex mechanism. Uh, and future development that we hope will happen someday. And also to add that uh, even through the WWF water risk filter and hello to the WWF colleagues who are attending this uh, conversation, uh, they provide also, you know, uh, indexes on water risk in the future, knowing about, you know, the, the climate change. So you could also use that kind of indexes to, to, to try to, to start to, to integrate that uh, future, uh, you know, evolutions. But uh, this is why we think that you can start to do things without waiting for that kind of, uh, of, uh, of developments, which are needed anyway, but will take time. So please, let's act to, together now uh, without waiting too much. And that's a perfect conclusion for this webinar. Thank you very much, Julien. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, Yuval, Julie, Paul, for being here. And of course, thank you for all of the, the audience uh, that, that came and, and asked the very interesting questions. Uh, and we'll uh, see each other later for a further uh, webinar of uh, Research Conversation uh, by AFD. Thank you all and have a good evening, afternoon.